So, what we have up next, oh, we have Paul Bingham and Joanne Souza. I've been looking forward to this paper, um, who will be talking to us about Paul Bingham. The unique power of the North American record allows tests of a new theory of social evolution. Oh, we are all so connected today. My thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to speak with you today. My academic background is in psychology, and Paul's is in the natural sciences, molecular and evolutionary biology. We've spent more than a decade in an extensive theoretical project with the goal of developing a robust general theory of human evolutionary origins and social behavior, including Paul's earlier work, and more recently, a detailed game theory and then an extensively documented volume describing the diverse implications of this work for not only human evolution and behavior, but history as well. When I first, okay. When I first started to dedicate my time to this project, it was because I realized when looking at human behavior more generally, there was excellent local theoretical projects in psychology, archaeology, and anthropology, for example, and there was much excellent empirical study, but there was no general good theory that crossed the borders, so to speak, or provided opportunity to cross-feed and synergize with one another. A good general theory should be based on broad predictive power and rigorous falsifiability, which just begs for such cross-feeding among the general theorists, the local theorists, and the empiricists in these different disciplinary areas. Now this type of border crossing has proved fruitful in the natural sciences, and we're certain that we can all be equally successful in the more social sciences. So we come to you today with a general theory giving us a great opportunity to together test its predictive power by subjecting it to possible falsification using the empirical evidence from multiple disciplines. Now there have been attempts at general theory before that have persisted, not because they were particularly strong, but because they generated hypotheses, hypotheses that were difficult to falsify in the first place, or they made no specific or narrow specific predictions. The other problem is a bit more subtle, and that is the failure to make the proximate ultimate cause distinction. Now analogy here is illuminating. We don't eat because we feel hungry. This is merely proximate causation. Rather, we eat because we're in non-equilibrium thermodynamic systems. Natural selection has shaped proximate psychological mechanisms causing us to behave as if we understood the second law. Likewise, our subjective psychological perceptions of the origins of our social behavior are almost completely unreliable as direct cues about the ultimate origins of that behavior. Our goal must be to go beneath those proximate perceptions and understand their ultimate origins. It is vital that we're not misled by our subjective psychological feelings. We constantly just run in circles, misled by our own proximate minds, forever interpreting what we see through our own subjective thoughts. We should only be influenced by empirical, testable predictions our theories make. This perspective is challenging, but it's utterly essential. Now, fundamentals of the theory itself. I'd like to give you a little bit of background on that. Now, we began our theoretical project with a massive body of work on the social behavior of non-human animals. First, let me give you some context from evolutionary biology. Social cooperation between all animals at all times is limited virtually exclusively by one single factor. Their conflicts of interest as genetic vehicles in the Malthusian world. The unit of interest is not the individual, nor is it groups of individuals, but rather genetic design information itself. Now this fact about the world makes conflicts of interest between non-kid individuals the crucial issue limiting social cooperation everywhere and always. In non-human animals, we see much cooperation between close kin. We see slight upticks here and there for narrow, specific, and short-term byproduct mutualism, but we don't see anything like the large kinship-independent social unit so obvious in humans. Humans do not somehow magically transcend the conflict of interest problem. Put differently, conflicts of interest cannot be overcome by any cognitive, linguistic, or cultural innovation. To assume they can be is to reverse cause and effect, and natural selection simply does not work that way. It may be a tempting hypothesis, but one that will forever just restate the question. Uniquely human properties like vast non-kin social cooperation, language, expanded cultural repertoire, and cognitive virtuosity are required to be effects of somehow our managing the conflict of interest problem first, not causes of that management. Now this is where the proximate, ultimate distinction must be made. 
We must see the ultimate causal origins of this uniquely human social behavior, not its proximal effects. Biological logic requires that the human management of non-kin conflicts of interest must be the ultimate cause of human uniqueness and must originate from Darwinian pursuit of adaptive biological self-interest. Third, at first glance, this sounds like a contradiction in terms that conflicts of interest arising from adaptive pursuit of self-interest can possibly be managed on that same basis. However, there appears to be one and only one condition under which this apparently paradoxical outcome is possible, specifically in an animal that can project lethal coercive threat from a substantial distance. Under these special circumstances, many individuals are able to simultaneously project threat against individual free riders, producing enormous reduction in individual cost and risk than projecting threat up close. In other words, law enforcement becomes a successful Darwinian adaptation in such an animal for the first time in the history of the planet. Now fourth, the original human ancestors around two million years ago first evolved this capacity to project lethal course of threat from a substantial distance as a result of elite human throwing. Now this allowed the very first successful emergence of self-interest and suppression of conflicts of interest on a small scale. The properties we think of as uniquely human, including language, cognitive virtuosity, expanded social cooperation, and enlarged cultural domain, and our ethical and political proximate psychologies all apparently evolved under this uh, resulting coercive umbrella. However, we didn't stop there. We continued to hone not just this first coercive strategy, but the technology and skills of law enforcement itself at ever larger scales over the course of our history. Now this very context is what makes our theory so robust in its predictive power about the ultimate causal logic of human history, which is the subject of this meeting today. And at this point, I'll turn over to Paul, who'll pick up the story. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, as Joanne mentioned, over the last decade, biologists have grown much more sophisticated in understanding the questions we need to ask to form common ground with anthropologists and archaeologists. More specifically, on the general theory that we have developed, in human historical adaptive sophistication is limited not by our individual intelligence, which is ancient, but rather by the scale of our social cooperation, determining in turn the amount of non-redundant cultural information we have access to. Moreover, the biological laws of social cooperation require that the scale of our social cooperation is completely limited by the scale of our ability to manage conflicts of interest. Thus, we predict that the scale of our social cooperation will be completely limited by the effective properties of the coercive technologies, that is, the weapons available for law enforcement. This general prediction, in turn, makes an enormous number of specific, testable, local predictions. Specifically, we predict that the human archaeological record should consist of an, a series of adaptive revolutions, periods of relatively rapid increases in sophistication, separated by extended periods of adaptive stasis, as diagrammed here. Moreover, each of these adaptive revolutions is unambiguously predicted to follow rapidly from the local introduction of new weapons that expand the effective scale of coercive threat. The empirical evidence strongly supports this view, we argue. By the way, we can, scale, uh, we can score adaptive sophistication in a variety of ways. They all seem to give convergent answers. We do expect local conditions, demographic and otherwise, to, induce, uh, to introduce some noise into the process, but that fluctuation is minor compared to the dominance of these major historical trends, we argue. As this audience is very well aware, the North American record is uniquely valuable. On the one hand, uh, what we will refer to here as North American Neolithic transitions were relatively recent, living, leaving an extensive fresh record. Moreover, North American archaeology has been relatively well funded and thus our understanding is extensive. This empirical feast represents one of the most exciting opportunities in all of archaeology to test broad general theories, including our own. Specifically, our theory predicts that each local Neolithic transition should be immediately preceded by the introduction of a fundamentally new coercive technology. Moreover, the empirical evidence strongly suggests that this new coercive technology was the bow. As most of you are aware, the introduction of the bow can be monitored by careful examination of a large sample of points. Moreover, in specific well-established analytical subcultures, we have extensive, well-dated stratigraphy of the introduction of the bow. As first noticed by John Blitz in his seminal 1988 paper, 
there uh, appears to be a continent-wide series of nearly simultaneous dramatic increases in complexity, here called Neolithic transitions. These appear to follow the local introduction of the bow. This is precisely the pattern our more general theory predicts and requires. In the ensuing 23 years since John's original paper, controversy has continued uh, about the chronology of the bow to percolate at a low level. However, several important punchlines appear relatively clear, we would argue, at this juncture. First, there are widely distributed cases of relatively abrupt local appearance of the bow between 400 and 800 CE. In particular, well in several particularly well-studied cases, fluorescence of new local Neolithic cultures follow rapidly. For example, the Adena Hopewell to Fort Ancient Mississippian transition involves ultimately dramatic increases in settlement size and powerful intensification of agriculture, together with other features. This transition follows rapidly after the local introduction of the bow, with first symptoms occurring within a generation, and then rapidly escalating complexity and intensification over the next several centuries. Similar is the basket maker to Pueblo transition in the southwest, though most of the details of this culture are different than the Mississippian case, an analogous pattern of agricultural intensification is seen. Again, this transition shows the characteristic rapidly escalating trajectory of complexification immediately following the import of the bow. The rise of the Chumash Neolithic culture in the Santa Barbara Channel is very different than the Mississippian or Pueblo adaptations, being largely based on marine assets. However, dramatic increases in economic intensification are nonetheless quite apparent. Once again, this transition follows the characteristic, with the characteristically rapidly escalating uh, temporal trajectory after the local introduction of the bow. This continent-wide synchronous complexification is an astonishing phenomenon in its own right. Our theory predicts it. Moreover, our theory accounts for the 10,000 year earlier occurrence of similar events in Southwest Asia. So where do we go from here? There are many opportunities to move forward in attempting to falsify the broad general theory we propose. Let me give you two quick examples. The Calusa of Southern Florida and the industrial scale buffalo processors of the Great Plains may be cases of bow following complexification worthy of more extensive documentation. Second, there are claims of much earlier introduction of the bow in several other environments, including Ken Ames' work in the Columbia Plateau, for example. If our theory is correct, there should be correspondingly earlier local increases in social complexity there, or we should discover that that version of the bow is a more primitive weapon, perhaps for birding, and such that its properties are insufficiently different than the preceding otlatl in terms of its uh, being a tool of social coercion and therefore without noticeable effect. If either of those two things is false, our theory is false unambiguously. Finally, and more generally, there is an urgent need to bring competing general theories into a common arena, forcing them to engage in competitive parsimony, evaluating them on the basis of their relative ability to make predictions, both many and readily falsifiable. Subcultures that do this will shape the future of archaeology, we argue. We look forward to participating in a network of investigators with a shared interest in capitalizing on the extraordinarily and vital opportunity to synergize general theory with the astonishingly rich North American record uh, in the near future. Uh, our contacts are here and our email addresses can be found at the university website. We are anxious to form relationships with others, uh, particularly North American archaeologists with similar uh, interests. Thank you for your time.